Welcome to the Business of Design podcast. I'm Cheryl Horn, Director of Operations for Business of Design. A lot has changed at Business of Design since this episode originally aired. For the latest information and rates on events and membership at Business of Design, head to businessofdesign.com. Enjoy the show. Hello, Business of Design listeners, supporters, and community. I am not in Bali as I plan to be. It seemed unwise to travel in light of the unfolding pandemic and today. I'm really glad I made the decision to stay home and be close to family and friends. I know we are all dealing with this global health crisis, and I did want to take a few minutes and update you on how Business of Design is adapting and responding, and then how my design team is adapting and responding. First, I do want to acknowledge that we realize this crisis is impacting each one of us. Many are processing feelings of fear, isolation, confusion, anger, and sadness around the unknown, not to mention the concerns we have about the future of our businesses and our client relationships. We hope to address some of these issues on the upcoming podcasts. Team BOD met remotely, and we agreed that halting podcast production does not serve our community. I know some of you will use this forced slowdown time to catch up on tasks that you've been meaning to do but never seemed to have time to do previously. Therefore, we are going to continue with the podcast as planned and in addition provide timely insights and updates as they are available. While voluntary social distancing may be necessary to protect our health, it is increasingly important that we come together in spirit as a community. While we may not be able to meet up in person right now, we are continuing to build our Business of Design community online, so let's show compassion for others and continue to engage online with sensitivity and care. We need each other now more than ever. While Team BOD is capable of working remotely with relative ease, I do want to acknowledge this may be more challenging for you in your design business, especially if you are at a critical juncture in a project right this moment. Our design team is suspending on-site project visits for the time being. Thankfully, we are all healthy and therefore we continue to work on projects from home. Although, as you know, if you do have small children at home, there are going to be additional challenges to that time. I think we are all optimistic this crisis will resolve itself through the selfless work of so many professionals, including those in the medical fields, but as well those people who provide essential services such as janitors and cashiers. Next week, I hope to share some workarounds we're implementing and talk about some of our client strategies. But for now, I just want you to know that you're not alone and normalcy will return. The episode you are about to hear was taped pre-coronavirus. So please forgive any references that seem glib or thoughtless in the current climate. They are unintended. And please stay healthy, everyone. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses, participate in monthly coaching calls, and find unlimited support within our exclusive members-only Facebook group. Unlike traditional coaching, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $79. Annual members save two months. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Before we jump into the interview, let me tell you about Andrew Mitchell, who is otherwise known as the Design Coach. He is based in Melbourne, Australia. He has run his interior design business for almost 20 years, and he says he's confident he's made almost every mistake under the sun and wants to share what he's learned with a community of peers close to him at home. So he started the Design Coach just two years ago. 
having struggled with isolation and what he terms a heavy case of imposter syndrome in the early years of his business, Andrew is driven to ensure that other designers take necessary steps to learn the foundations of healthy self-care so they experience success in all areas of their life, not just work. In just two short years, the Design Coach has grown to a worldwide community and plays host to a variety of educational events, including masterclasses with industry influencers, design lab sessions that dissect the design process, and hugely successful retreats to Byron Bay on the north coast of New South Wales, Australia. I, for one, am looking so forward to being in Byron Bay with Business of Design members and supporters and enthusiasts. I'll be teaching a portion of the learning at the retreat, and then I will be enjoying the rest of the retreat with everyone else. This is Andrew's baby. He's a great guy. I think you would really enjoy spending time with him. So those of you who can make the retreat in September, head to thedesigncoach.com.au for more information. And now back to the show. So thank you so much for uh, coming on today to be able to talk to me. I, I really just want to be able to ask you some questions about your inspirations for why you got into um, creating business of design. Um, I know that the designers that are coming along to see you in are really excited not only just to hear your teachings, but also to learn a little bit more about you as the powerhouse that runs business of design, but also your very successful interior design business. So you're an incredible role model for people. And, and I think that what I wanted to do today is just ask a few questions, if that's all right, just to find out a little bit more about what makes you tick. Very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to just say thank you when people say nice things about me because, yeah. you know, the the natural yeah. inclination is go like, no, I'm not a powerhouse. No. Anyway, yeah. it's very sweet. Thank yeah. you. I feel very grateful and I'm happy to answer questions. I don't, you know, I think I'm better as an interviewer than an interviewee, but we'll yeah. find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Um, so I just think personally and Professionally, you're a really good role model for the industry because um, you're sharing so much information so um, generously um, and you uphold yourself with absolute integrity all the time. It's, uh, it's really inspiring and I think that more so now than ever uh, in a world where there's so much chaos, it's really important to bring a sense of calm and integrity to everything that we do. Um, I'm really interested to know why you started with business of design. What was the, the inspiration for coaching and mentoring designers? It's funny. I don't even know when I started business of design because it was never my intention to create a new company. I found myself struggling so hard just to keep it together in the design business. I loved doing the design and the decorating part, but there was no doubt I was disappointing clients on a regular basis. And that turned up in my life with not having repeat and referral customers. It turned up in getting what I call Canadian fired, where you get about 70% done and then they tell you like, Hey, we love everything you did, Kimberly, and we're just going to like scuttle down to TJ Maxx and finish it ourselves now. And then, of course, you don't yeah. get any beautiful photographs. You certainly don't get repeat and referral customers. And so I had a lot of shame about that. I had the impression, like a lot of designers I meet, that everybody else was doing great and I was the only one who was struggling. And um, yeah. You know, when I got together with my designer friends, we trash talked the trades and we trash talked the suppliers and we trash talked the clients. Um, but there was very little self reflection going on. Um, and there was just something in me that knew I was the common denominator. You, you couldn't possibly have all bad clients. Like, it's just not possible, right? Yeah. They can't all be crazy, they can't all be jerks. I knew it was me, and so I began to feel a, a lot of shame and embarrassment around it, so much so that I considered quitting. And um, a last 
ditch effort to save my soul and save my business uh, came in the form of hiring a business coach. And that coach essentially told me that I was doing everything wrong, like literally everything wrong. There was, except for my passion and waking up every day feeling optimistic, she said, everything else has to go. You have to start over. You can't fix this. It's too broken. And um, how did that how did that feel when when you heard that news? Was that uh, <sighs> was it a wake up call or was it was it um, really devastating? It's so funny. I am so stubborn. I am such a Aries like <laughs> bull. Like I guess a bull is Taurus. So I guess I'm a Taurus. I guess I'm just an Aries. I'm super bossy, and I I'm sure if I just work harder and apply myself, I can figure this out. And so. Actually, when she first told me that, I thought she was wrong. And I thought, I'm going to convince her that she's wrong and I'm right. And so I spent a good deal of money the first, you know, three to six months of my coaching experience trying to explain to this coach how the industry worked and why she didn't really understand it all. And uh, it, it took about six months until... She had been harping on a couple of things. Number one, I had good employees, but I didn't have great employees. And her feeling was a good employee is sometimes more detrimental to you than a bad employee because you get rid of a bad employee. But a good employee, you keep working around, you keep stepping over them, you keep twisting yourselves into a pretzel so you can make them happy or make the work manageable for them. And I had a, I had a whole bunch of good employees, but I didn't have great employees. Um, and I finally, there were a few things that happened that kind of made that resonate for me. I completely understood what she meant. And then the second thing she was harping on, I say harping because that's how I felt at the time, but now I think she was so wise. She said, if you don't have systems and procedures to run your business, you'll never be a success. You should quit. And I kept trying to explain to her that this is a creative business. Every project is different. Every budget is different. Every client is different. And she kept digging her heels in and saying, no, you are running a Starbucks and people need to know what exactly a cappuccino is like. And if you can't tell them that, then you should quit. And she kept saying, I should quit. I should quit. And I'm like, I don't want to quit, you know? So anyway, I worked with her. It was... Was there a pivotal moment that you actually had a come to Jesus? Aha, she is actually, she does know what she's talking about. (laughs) There was actually, there really was. Um, We were, every Tuesday we do a meeting, which we call Top Line. And at Top Line, we review every single client, the status of every single project. And when we finish a project, we created something we call the client binder. And so we had finished a project, let's say it was Mrs. Smith, and I said, okay, we're finished Mrs. Smith, who's going to do the binder? And then somebody said, oh, I'll do the binder. A week went by, and that person brought the binder to top line, and we all looked at it, and we said, hey, wait a minute, where are the floor plans? The floor plans should be in there. And what about the paint chips? We should put paint chips in there. And then another week went by, and she brought it back, and she made those changes. And then somebody said, wait a minute, shouldn't we put the warranty information in there? Oh, yeah, we should put the warranties in there. And what about fabric swatches? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. We should put the fabric. So anyway, this went on for months. And the person kept tweaking the binder, tweaking the binder, tweaking the binder. And finally, we got it. Yeah, it's ready to go. Send the binder. Sure enough, another week goes by and it's time to wrap up another project. This time, let's call her Mrs. Jones. So Mrs. Jones, uh, the project is done. Who's going to do the client binder? Somebody says, I'll do the client binder. So they go away for a week. They come back with the client binder. It looks nice, but it looks different than the last client binder. So we're trying to figure it out. Like, huh, the last one, the drawings, remember she had a tab. It looks really good with the tab. Oh, yeah, I should do a tab. Yeah. And then there should be a cover sheet. There's no cover sheet. And then don't forget the warranties. Okay. So this went on for a month or two, and we finally got the binder ready to go, and off it went. And then sure enough, we finished another job. Mr. Anderson's job is finished. Who's going to do the binder? And somebody puts their hand up and then says, now, what's in the binder? And we all start talking about what's in the binder. And I look around the table, and there's like nine of us. And I'm like, none of this time is billable. We have now spent a year of our lives talking about binders. I'm sure if we added up all the time we spent on the binder, I, it would be a year of my life I would not get back. And it was, it was like 
a major epiphany. I'm like, oh my God, I, I actually felt physically sick. I'm going to throw up is what I said. I think I'm going to throw up. What's going on? I said, she's right. We need systems. We need a procedure. We need to know how the binder looks every single time. Like the binder shouldn't be different every time. It should be exactly the same every time. It yep. shouldn't be this hard, you know? And then, so then we spent another month or so creating what we thought at that time was a perfect binder. And what happened next is I never had to talk about the binder again. We wrote down the steps yep. to the binder. We created a series of binders that were ready to go with templates and tabs and cover sheets all ready to go. They just had to be modified to suit the clients. And we kind of produced the idiot's guide to producing a binder. And from that day to this day, I've never seen a client binder. I don't look at them anymore. Was that a good representation of, of how you were operating in every, every part of the business yeah. at that stage? Yeah. Because yeah. I realized like, oh, for, I realized two things. Number one, my business coach has been right. I've been paying her for a year and arguing with her, which is a stupid waste of money. So what I should have done the minute she told me is to go ahead and start creating systems. But I didn't. I'm stubborn. So I spent, you know, I blew $100,000 like being like arrogant. Um, so then I realized if the second thing that occurred to me is if if she's right about that and a system for that could change my life so dramatically, so quickly, what else do I need to create a system for? And then... Once the staff started seeing the benefit of the systems, they got enrolled. And then they started wanting to create systems. And and then every time something went wrong, like, oh, my gosh, you know, where is the fabric for Mrs. Smith's family room pillow? Why can I not find it? Where does it go? Where is it supposed to be? And then everybody would get frustrated and they'd say, we need a system. We need a procedure. And, you know, it took, it took years. Now the operations binder is you know, hundreds of pages long and we're working on uh, content where we distribute uh, our operations binder to the members. Um, but for me, it was, it was, it was, it took a year, but once I got it, I, that was it. So what, at what time was all of this happening? Was this um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? Well, it was definitely past 2000. Uh, probably 2001, yep. and then by 2004, um, I had just been started speaking. So what happened was I was sharing with somebody who we purchase uh, residential carpets from. I was sharing with him what I was learning with my business coach, and he was just fascinated. And he's like, you know, we do these designer events um, twice a year where we like have wine and food and would you like to come and talk about what you're learning with your business coach and of course I was like no <laughs> no absolutely not I don't <laughs> want people to know what a loser I am and uh he said you know I, I really think it would benefit other people and um I, I would really appreciate it. it would be a big favor if you would do it for me so I said oh you know all right okay so anyway, he has this event, and I'll never forget it. There were like a hundred designers in the room, and wow. I was sweating. I was so nervous. I oh my god, I was scared to death. And I thought, well, this is it. You know, tell them the truth, or you're wasting their time. Yeah. Like, just tell them the truth. Yeah. So I started at the beginning. I told it them so much. That, that takes so much bravery to do that. So much vulnerability. Oh my God, I was scared. I was so scared. Um, and I started yeah. at the beginning. I told them about the first client I ever had and all the mistakes I made. And then I told them I've been doing this now for 12, 13, 14 years. And I'm still making these mistakes. And I told them the most embarrassing, humiliating interactions I've ever had with clients. Um, I teared up a couple times because I'm a little bit you know, of a sap. Um yeah. And and then uh, I could see, like, I could see the audience. They were tearing up and they were nodding their heads and, like, and then I told them, like, oh, and so this is what my business coach has been teaching me. And I just shared a few things. And then I, I just, at the end of that, like, hour and a half or whatever, it was unbelievable. It was the first time I'd ever experienced 
true camaraderie within the interior design community. People were crying and hugging and laughing and talking wow. and saying, me too, me too, me too. And that is not my experience of the interior design community in Toronto at all. Quite the opposite. Like you go to parties and you say, how are you? And everybody's like, oh my gosh, amazing. Best year ever. Best clients ever. I've got it going on, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I could, I mean, it was just so clear to me, like, wow, I'm not alone. It was the first time, the very first time I thought, I'm not alone. I, there's other people who yeah. feel like I feel. I think you're creating, you're creating change in the industry um, by encouraging designers to be open with each other and sharing their experiences and sharing their systems and, and processes. Um, I think we've come so far. I've been in the industry 25 years, and I think that there is a lot more happening, but I still think there's not enough. And, and you're at the forefront creating this change. What do you see we still need to do to make that even more powerful? I'd like to see more associations grasp the business aspects of being an interior design professional. And I would like to see them really put the wind at our backs instead of putting obstacles at our feet. Um, yeah. And I would like to see young people being educated at school in a better way, in a much more effective way. Yes. The truth is, I don't think the education has improved one bit since I graduated in 1991. I'm appalled when I'm asked to speak in a business class at what the curriculum looks like. And, you know, we we just, I don't know. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I think schooling continues way beyond formal education, and that's what you're doing. You're, you're educating designers, not just in business um, skills, but also in life skills as well. And that's what I'm hoping to be doing with designers as well. So I think the more, the more um, companies that we have like ours, the, the stronger the community will be. But I, I totally agree with you is that schools have a responsibility to be teaching business skills to to designers who, you know, there's a good high proportion of students that go through design school that eventually want to have their own business and, and no one's teaching these really fundamental skills. No, yeah. Yeah, so my one of my lofty goals now is to... Um, produce some education for schools that could be rolled out to a much, you know, ah, not necessarily wonderful. younger, but new, like to those who are just entering the profession. And I, and again, I would really like the associations to get on board and start talking to designers as if we are a profitable billion dollar industry and not dunderheaded idiots who can't do the work ourselves. So, um, cool. yeah, those are my dreams. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant dream and that's a big thing, that's a big push is, is bringing business education into interior design school. So, mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully it's, it's, it's happening. Hopefully there's change ahead. I love that there are like-minded people in this with me as yeah. well, like you. You know, we've discussed the fact that yeah. you have impeccable integrity and obviously you're running an interior design firm. So that that makes us unique, right? We actually are working with clients yeah. where none of my teachers worked with clients or they did for about an hour and they hated it. And so then they taught. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, if you're going to be a surgeon, you better be learning from somebody who's done some surgery, and still practicing surgery. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, one of the things that I'm totally open about is that I've made lots of mistakes and I continue to make mistakes, but I think the most important thing about that is learning from your mistakes. So I think being in the industry practicing, you're still continuing to make mistakes and, and learn from those mistakes. Hopefully they're not too big mistakes but that nevertheless they're, they're important learning tools mm -hmm. what do you think can you would you share with with me one of the biggest mistakes that you've made in in business and, and what did you learn <laughs> from that 
do you want this week or can I go? I mean, I, honestly, well, I feel like I <laughs> no matter how many mistakes I've made, honestly, you guys, I figure out a way to make another one. So I'll tell you one that's recent, which is really puzzling. So we did a huge renovation for clients and we, we uh, encouraged them to hire a different company to help them do some editing uh, and get rid of some of the things that they had because we didn't want to put a whole bunch of things in storage and then have to um, pay for storage for a year and a half and then try to get rid of those things. It's better to get rid of them before you do it. So anyway, we had this professional company come in and inventory everything, box everything, label everything, tag everything, get everything looking, uh, get, get everything really organized. So when the movers came to put things in storage, we would know what was in there we would know uh, what we had to work with when it came back out. And everything went well, except for we were missing boxes 101 to 105. Um, 101 to 105 just happened to be a series of antique and first edition books. So we had oh. pictures of the spines. Uh, we had pictures of the books. Uh, we had inventory, so we knew the names of the books. Um, and for whatever reason, those boxes were not with the movers when they returned to drop everything off. Now we had 200 boxes. So the movers moved everything in the house. We didn't go through and count box number one, box number two, box number three. So we didn't know that boxes 101 to 104 were missing, but we signed the documentation saying we received the 200 boxes. Um, and then afterwards, you can imagine what happened. The movers say they don't have the boxes. We say we don't have the boxes. And the client says, where are my expensive books? There's a note at the bottom of the documentation from the mover saying that the client decided to move the antique books off site. The client doesn't oh, remember wow. that. We don't remember it. But there is a note right there in the documentation. And it happens to correspond with the four boxes that are missing. So what do you do? Who's at fault? So I think, no big deal. I'll just call my insurance company. and We're going to have to run it through my insurance. I've never used it before. This has got to be errors and omissions. Nope. Nope. Not at all. The insurance company says, I'm not covered for that particular thing. And my only recourse is to sue the moving company. But if I sue the moving company, I know I will lose because the documentation says the client took the books off site. So the client's looking at me, rightly so, and saying, where are my books? And I don't have an answer. So I'm actually meeting her tomorrow to tell her a few ideas in terms of options. Um, all of them involved wow. involve me writing a check. And this is why I say to everybody, this is so not a hobby. Um, in, in the 25 no. years or whatever I've been in business, this has never happened. It's highly unusual. It probably won't happen to you. But if the worst case scenario is I have to write her yeah. a big check, I can afford to do that. I, I won't mean I have to sell my car or have a fight with yep. my husband. It will mean that I don't make as much money this year, but I will survive. And you just never know when that thing is coming, right? So that what's, the, what's the lesson in that? I'm struggling to, to sort of look at what you <laughs> would have done wrong. I mean, you seem to have done everything. You had the documentation. There's been effective communication. Yeah. Um, is is the the lesson that you just don't deal with a company that you're not familiar with? Or no, we've used we've where, used both where, of these companies many times. I think the one lesson I can take away is that we would, in fact, have to count the boxes next time, and we would have identified for the, before the movers left that we did not receive 101 to 104. But in fact, yeah. because there's that note at the bottom of the documentation, it doesn't really help us. So... The lesson, I think, is you yes. guys, you better have insurance and you can get hurt. And, of course, I'm going to follow up with my insurance company and say, why do I pay you? I'm not sure because if this isn't covered, yeah. what what is covered? I'm a little shocked by this um, announcement that this is yeah. not covered. So sometimes, you know, guys, when you're in business, you just get, you know, you just get hurt, right? You just get hurt and yeah. you, you need to be able to roll with it. That's can... the price of doing business. Thank you so much for sharing that because I can I can hear that it's still hurting and <laughs> yeah. it's still not oh so you you've still got that final stretch of communication with the client mm -hmm. that 
it might come down to a financial um, reimbursement, but but the client's still not going to be happy, and that that needs to be dealt with as well. Yeah. You know, you've. I mean, I think the thing, the biggest thing that hurts is disappointing a client. Oh, um, yes. But you know, I think also in those circumstances, it's an opportunity to prove to a client how mature and professional you are by the way that you handle it. So I think I have no doubt that you'll come up trumps. <laughs> I hope so. She, these clients happen to be really nice and quite, um, quite grounded. So I know that they appreciate the mess this is. And um, yeah. they did put some things off site. So there were some items that went off site. So there, there's definitely some ambiguity there. And, you know, sometimes when we're solving yeah. problems, you could, all you can do is offer a solution that makes people sort of happy, you know, because what would really make them yeah. happy is to get their books back. Of course, of course. And look, they may turn up somewhere. Hopefully, fingers crossed. One hopes, yeah. So you mentioned before about uh, employing a uh, a business coach in in the early stages of sort of transforming your business. And I believe 100% that mentors and coaches are so important because asking for help um, is number one is is a big thing because we can't do it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, But number two, also coaches and and mentors can be really good for holding you to account. So helping you to follow through with all of the goals that you're setting. Who do you who do you turn to for? I know you've got a really supportive, amazing team. So Cheryl is, you know, the backbone of business of design. She's just incredible, and I'm sure you've got an incredible team of designers. But what about from a big picture perspective with what's happening with Kimberly Selden Design and business of design? What who do you go to for support and mentoring? I have continued to work with various business coaches, some more successful than others. And, um, you know, now I'm at a stage two where I'm not afraid to ask people who are business owners outside of the industry what they think. And that has been extremely yeah. helpful to just reach out to, for example, some of the some of my friends who work in banking or the financial world and just you know, kind of lay out a yep. problem and, and see what they say. And I'm sort of amazed at how direct they often are about all of it. Like, here's the situation. Um, nobody's going to win if we do this and this. So this is what I propose. And in- incredibly, I find um, often I, I make things a much bigger deal than they are. You know, in my head, it seems like I can't tell the client that. But when I run it by somebody else who's not an interior design professional, they're like, yes, you can. And you will. You just do it right now. Get it over with. I'm like, oh, all right. And then it goes fine. Yeah. Great. Um, I think that I look at from the outside perspective, you fit an awful lot into your life. You've got your business of design work that seems to be growing and growing and becoming an international phenomenon. You've got your interior design business, which is ridiculously successful and you're doing some beautiful work. Um, But you're also doing TV, you're doing broadcasts, podcasts, creating content for the the, um, business of design website, you're doing speaking events, coming to Australia. I'm exhausted just thinking about all of that. So how do you, you you're so up, um, you, how do you maintain that all important balance in your life and make sure that you're not burning yourself out? Gosh, um, you know, it's not always balanced. That's the truth. Sometimes I go a little bit too heavy into work and I can do that because my children are grown. So I'm not, you know, I'm not depriving them of their mother or anything like that. Um, but I think the more systems you have in place, the more you don't have to supervise. And so I find myself surrounded by a team that, for example, if I would ask Cheryl or I soon or Victoria, any of them, any of them, if I would say, can you do the following thing? When they say, yes, I never think about it again. I do not have to go back and check if they did it. And that's 
one thing I've learned, that's the difference between a good employee and a great employee. A good employee, you go like, hey, did you get that thing done that I asked you to do? Uh, and a great employee, you never think about it again. It's as good as done the minute you mm-hmm. ask them to do it. So um, that that helps a lot and for that's, sure. That's largely, aside from making sure that you're employing wonderful people, it's largely down to the systems and processes that you've put in place. Well, it is because they. I found I had really good people come and work for me, but without those systems written down, they didn't know how to make me happy. And so they would do a job. In fact, I just got off the phone today. I was coaching uh, a business of design member. And um, she was saying that all the time, you know, on the weekends, she'll go in and she'll fix things that people did during the week and she'll tweak them so that they, they're good for her. And then when people quit, they say to her, like, I just, I never know how to make you happy. Or I didn't bother yeah. doing a good job on that thing because I knew you would change it anyway. And that was exactly the kind of feedback I used to get from staff. Um, they did not appreciate that I would go behind the scenes and, and tweak things, but I just did not have time to train them for what I wanted them to do. And yet when you take, when you, you know, really face it and you write the system down, then they could, they can follow the system. They can produce the result that you want and then they can succeed, right? Because people quit if they can't succeed, if they can't feel like they're winning sometimes or most days, they're going to quit, and also, I think it's really important that the learning tool as a manager is that you need to allow people to make mistakes as mm, well, yeah. because we all make mistakes. We as directors of a business make mistakes, and you have to allow your team to make mistakes, and you can't micromanage people to avoid making mistakes, right. because it just eats away at their self, self-worth and mm-hmm. their self-confidence. And if you power, empower people and trust them, that they may make a couple of mistakes, but they'll fix it because mm-hmm. they, they want to do the best possible for you. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. It's a good place to be. The next part of that, too, I think, is let let them fix the mistakes because people would make mistakes and then I would fix it because I didn't have time to explain to them. And that just delayed yep. them learning by, you know, years and years. So don't fix it. Tell them to fix it. Tell them why it's a mistake and then tell them to fix it. And then you'll learn a lot about their character. Are they complainers? Are they whiners? Are they going to make, are they going to punish you because you've asked them to go back and correct something? In which case you can't have them on your team. They just can't. And the other thing that was really helpful to me, there's a guy named, I I think it's Bruce, Bruce Coxon. Yeah. He's on Shark Tank. Um, And he spoke at an event for us and he said, if people can do something 80% as well as you can, let them do it. So I thought, oh, there you go. Like, good, good to know. (laughs) Yeah. And my, my philosophy is also that there'll be things, uh, areas that they will perform 80% at, but then there'll be areas that they might perform 120% better than, than what you can provide. So true. Because younger, more enthusiastic, or just better trained, or just have a different skill set altogether. And it's, that's what makes having it been so exciting. Yeah, exactly. It's Bruce Croxon, by the way. I have to get his name right. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I think that you, the services that you're offering with Business of Design is exactly the right time, exactly the right place, you're doing exactly what is needed for the industry at the moment. So what's coming up in the next 12 to 24 months with business of design and also for you with Kimberly Seldon Design? Ooh, we are on the cusp of unleashing some new and exciting things at business of design because we know more now. We know more because you guys have been so generous with us sharing what you need, sharing what you've learned, sharing what you hope for, that we've been able to modify our systems and procedures and strategies and techniques and learning to be a simplified version, a better version, a stronger version. So in the next six to 12 months, there will be some exciting changes for business of design, all good, nothing that will impact people who are already members, um, We decided in 2010 that 
if somebody was willing to trust us, we wanted to be able to honor whatever price they signed up at. So if you're already a member, we'd like to honor that price indefinitely if we can. It's challenging because as we rebuild the website, and we've done that four times, by the way, people probably don't even know it's happened because we've been very careful to hire the right teams of people and make sure there were little to no disruption. Uh, but so we've rebuilt the website four times. We will go through a fifth rebuild. Technology is better. It's faster. But more importantly, we've been able to incorporate what I've learned on the journey over the last 15 years, which is a lot. And I'm so grateful to this community because you guys have been a sounding board. I've been able to share my process and what I'm thinking and what's happening. And you have been there every step of the way. So I can't thank you enough. We will um, share the details of the changes, but suffice to say, we will offer programs that are a little bit more follow the bouncing ball uh, for those people who really don't know where to start or how to start or how to implement. We are updating the three books that I have, volume one, volume two, volume three. And if you already own those books, you probably won't need to buy the updated version. I'll leave it up to you. Some of the language is changing because times have changed. Um, So, you know, instead of just saying we get a check from our clients, sometimes we get an e-transfer or a money transfer. Um, So some of it's, you know, pedantic like that. You don't have to worry about it. And then those things that are policy procedure changers, I talk about that during membership all the time. So we do try to make sure members stay up to date with the changes as I'm going along. So that's exciting. We're really thrilled about that. We now know what our events are. The Business of Design Elite Retreat is extremely popular. We'll continue to do that. It is, you know, an anchor to the year for for many members who just look forward to that moment. And we are relaunching Business of Design Bootcamp, which is 15 steps in 15 hours. So for those who listen to the podcast and you'd like to know what Business of Design's 15-step project management strategy is about, this is a two-day event that can just change your world uh, overnight or at least over two nights. <laughs> and as I said, we are working on textbooks and an operations manual, which will go live this year. So many things to look forward to. I couldn't be more proud of the work that we do here and um, couldn't be happier that I've been able to associate with wonderful people like you who are also doing incredibly valuable work. Um, and then Kimberly Sound Design Group, we're kind of having a really good phase right now where I'm able to pick and choose the customers or the the projects, I guess, that are exciting to me, that are really meaty and uh, are bigger, a little bit bigger and more long-term projects that I enjoy more. And then I'm able to refer some of the small jobs that we just don't want to do anymore to designers that we've known and have worked with. So I think that's kind of exciting. It took me a long time to get there because saying no to any job was like uh, so painful for me before. But now I realize there's not, there's no lack of work. There's always going to be work. And so if I say no to a couple jobs this year um, and they go to someone else, that's good. F- everybody wins, right? Nobody loses. So I'm excited Wonderful. about just continuing to fine tune who our ideal client is. Yeah. So how how big is your team now at Kimberly Selden Design? There are, on the design side, there are four people I work with all the time. And then on the business of design side, there's uh, two, well, there's really two and a half. There's three people, I guess, um, on business of design, which is, which is just exciting. Cause as I said, we never intended to start a business like that was just never the idea, but that first speaking engagement led to the next, it led to the next. And, um, finally a year came about 2003 and I was getting on a plane all the time. And, uh, Kimberly Selden design group was paying for me to get on a plane and go speak about business of design. And, uh, because I profit share, with my team, the designer said, hey, wait a minute, why are we spending all this money on business of design? I'm like, well, because I love it. And these are really, it's really important. They're like, yeah, no, not going to happen. So, um, 
Yeah. So then uh, Cheryl piped up, uh, God lover, and said, you know, we need to take this online anyway. You're out of the office too much. Let's take it online. And uh, from there, it's just kind of grown and blossomed. It's so fun how many people are just discovering us and say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're you're new. And we're like, we're not new. (laughs) We started in 2004. Yeah. (gasps) So uh, it's, well, thank God it's really she started fun. in 2004. <laughs> I know. Believe me, I can I just tell you, like when I talk to designers, it's for me. I feel like it's my therapy. I like I'm laying on a couch somewhere and uh, yeah. I just I would not be able to stick to the policies and procedures we have if I wasn't talking about it all the time. I just would not. I would go yeah. back to my old ways. Yeah, it's a, it's a form of accountability, isn't it? It's, Absolutely. It's when you're when you're sharing with people your truth, then you're much more likely to follow through with it. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Now we're so excited that you're coming out, meeting your loyal fans, and hopefully patting a kangaroo and a, a koala. Um, what other plans have you got while you're in Australia? Ooh, I haven't really planned my Australian adventure this year, except to say that I'm really excited to be in Byron Bay with you. Like that is definitely a highlight. I'm excited to hang out in Sydney with some business of design members. Um, that's going to be a beautiful thing. I think we're going to go and see the Great Barrier Reef um, because one must, right? And uh, Alaru, the big, beautiful spiritual rock. I think that sounds fascinating. And other than that, maybe go back to Mornington Peninsula or uh, Barossa Valley for, you know, wine. <laughs> so there's not enough yeah, time. More wine country. Yeah, okay. Oh, wine. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm really, really appreciative that you took the time to, to have this interview. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for everything you do. Um, Design Coach does really much needed, important work, and uh, I'm grateful that you're in my life. So thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for being a part of the Business of Design community. If you love what you hear on the podcast, take the next step by signing up at businessofdesign.com. As our thank you, you'll gain access to Business of Design's 15-step project management strategy, a free introductory course which includes three business of design systems you can implement for immediate results. And when you're ready for success, a business of design membership, monthly or annual, will dramatically improve your business and your life. What are you waiting for? Together we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today. 